All right, hi everyone. I'm Connor from MWR Cybersecurity, and today I'm going to be talking to you about a um, privilege escalation vulnerability using inter-process communication, or the alternative name for this talk is how I cheese my way to root on a Mac. So just some history. We were doing an assessment on some Mac-specific software, which obviously needed access to some sensitive functionality. However, when I clicked the button to use this functionality, it just worked. No root prompt, nothing like that. So at that point, you should be alarmed because something has happened in the background. The process didn't magically just get those permissions. And the first thing I thought of was, maybe this is using some form of inter-process communication. This happened to be the case, and it was using what's known as distributed objects on Mac OS, which has been uh, aggressively deprecated for about eight years now. So we did some research, found some other software, and today is essentially the culmination of that research. So just for some context, if, everyone does not, if anyone doesn't know what IPC is, it's just a way for two different processes to communicate. A neat little party trick is you can take TCP dump and pipe the output into A-Play, which will make some beeps and bops depending on what's going on in your network. Um, there's many different ways to do that. You have files, sockets, signals, et cetera. But again, we'll be talking specifically about distributed objects. So for whatever reason, the kind of um, thing they went for here is calling it vended classes. I have absolutely no idea. Conceptually, it doesn't actually match very well to what's happening. But the point is you have a server, and that can take a class and then vend it to a client. And the client can use any method defined on this vended object. Again, don't know where the vending machine comes from. <laughs> So the important bit is that the class executes in the context of the server and with the server's permission. So that's where the privilege escalation comes from. So now we're going to jump into some objective C, hide your kids. Um, but this is very simple. We need two things to reproduce a malicious client. The name of the service as well as the definition of the function or the class that's being vended. So if we just look at a very simple example, we can see here... At the top, that would be the definition of one of the functions that are being vended. We can see it returns an NS string pointer and takes in an NS integer. So that's already one thing that we need. We know the types now. And the second thing would be the name of the service. So here we can see the example main. We create a NS connection object, pass it a service name. So you don't bind to an IP and a port, you bind to a service name. And we then pass it the service object itself. So that's the only two things you need to be able to reproduce a malicious client for one of these servers. If we look at the client example, we can see that we are importing the IPC service, service object at the top. Then we use the NS connection class to get a pointer to our service object. If we were able to connect to the vendor object correctly, we'll get a pointer back. If not, it's null. So we've got a few different approaches we can take to find these values. You can do a static approach or a dynamic approach. The static approach involves using Hopper or Adore 2, and the dynamic approach uses something like Freedom. So this is the lazy mode, where we can use grep or something like Adore 2 to just list the classes and give us some more information about what they do. Uh, literally very easy, just strings and then pipe into grep. You can do this on the entire file system if you really wanted to. It's a bit of fun. And then we have the easy mode, which I unfortunately only found after my assessment. So if you open a binary with Hopper, you can pick this option that just exports the entire thing as an Objective-C header file, which gives you this pretty verbose thing. The only thing that you'll notice is we don't have the actual types of the methods. And without the types, we don't really know what this thing is doing. Then we move on to Frida. So what I'm doing here, I hope it's readable, we're using Frida to attach to the server, and we're just dumping any method that belongs to the vendor object. And doing that, we can also interact with the arguments and kind of get an idea for what they are. So you'll see there's get info command 0x141. Uh, that's obviously not a pointer, it's just a normal integer. So get info command must then take in an integer. And there we have it, we have that information. From a dynamic perspective, the only other thing we need is the name of the service object. Same thing, we just use a free to trace command, and that will give us the service name in the middle of the screen there somewhere. Um, I did want to give a shout out to the SensePost tool for some of the SensePost team for some of the phenomenal tooling that they built. You can also use Objection to get this and much more information. It's a really, really great tool. So at this point, the next step is just simply copy pasting this into an editor. Unfortunately, this doesn't work anymore. So you can't build a new Xcode project and use this. You have to clone an old project or target an older runtime. 
So at the time, I did a lot of effort to get this POC working. I finally run it, and absolutely nothing happens. I am absolutely crushed. <laughs> but luckily, I tried just cloning an older project, and that turns out to work. The reason this happens is what I mean by aggressively deprecated. If you try to use these interfaces targeting a newer runtime, they just fell hard and fell fast very deliberately. So you're not supposed to be building software with these anymore. So then let's just very briefly chat about what's in the wild. Um, we found two privilege escalation vulnerabilities for two separate sets of software, as well as then this third one where we were able to essentially change very sensitive configuration options using any process that's on the machine. Fairly interesting stuff. Now let's dive into the source code. I'm hoping this is also readable. Can anyone spot the method that is dangerous? If you weren't at OxCon. <laughs> Yeah? Uh, not you, John. <laughs> Anyone want to take a stab at it? <laughs> Which one, Anessa? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so actually, a bit of a disclaimer here. Any of these methods can be dangerous. I explicitly focused on executing login shell because that's literally the lowest possible hanging fruit. So you can see there that takes an NS string and then an array of NS strings. So Program name, arguments, very easy. You don't even have to do any reverse engineering. You could have literally just guessed this. So what does this proof of concept actually look like? I just want to clarify, you do need code execution to be able to do this. Um, we're going to be executing what's known as a stager stager because it's going to stage my stager. And then my stager will execute a reverse shell only if MacVim was being run as root. Okay, so just showing that there's no active sessions. I can't actually see what's going on on the screen here or there, so I'm just kind of guessing. Um, we're building the process in Xcode. No active sessions, nothing is happening. Then I'll be invoking MacVim from the terminal. You can see at the bottom it says no connection because there's nothing there yet. We'll see a yay because there's one connection. And then we can go back, but we get no shell back because it's not running as root, so we don't particularly care about that shell. Go back, run an alias to just invoke MacVim with root. And you'll see one more yay followed by a reverse shell in a second or two. There we go. And just to prove that the shell is running as root, we can just do a quick who am I, and you'll see that we are in fact root. Something interesting about this that the MacVim maintainer pointed out is, yes, if you happen to be running this as root, you get privilege escalation straight to root, but also on Mac, Processes don't have access to all of your directories. So your documents directory, for example, if you have a random piece of software that tries to read it, you'll get a prompt that says, do you want to allow access to this program to read it? However, in this case, if you're using MacVim, presumably you're a developer, you would have granted it permission to some of those directories anyway. So in this way, we can not only you know, progress to root, we can also get access to sensitive directories that you'd otherwise not have access to. And cool, guys, that's the demo. Um, just for the closing remark, I really thought this would not work. I don't think there would be any software that uses this. Eight years is a fairly long time. Right? <laughs> but yeah, it turns out it was worth looking at. I didn't look into iOS or any proprietary software. I think there's some space for more research to be done there as well. And then if you're interested in IPC mechanisms on Mac in general, go have a look at uh, Ian Beer from Project Zero's research. Really phenomenal stuff. It's um, miles above what just happened here. <laughs> and then, yeah, thanks for everyone who supported me during the research, and thanks for the opportunity. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, when you said there's a, you had that list of functions that were exposed. Yeah. Right? Sorry. <laughs> when you had that list of functions that were exposed, you mentioned that any of them could be vulnerable, right? Yeah. Uh, and we zoomed in on the one particular what did you mean by that? Look. So at the end of the day, it depends on what the function is doing. Because the when I was talking to the MacVim maintainer, his thought was, why would you be able to have multiple clients connecting to the service? Which So his assumption was you couldn't have multiple clients, but you can have multiple clients. The other assumption was that only processes signed by the same developer certificate would be able to connect to that service, which isn't true either. But at the end of the day, all those interfaces have some kind of functionality associated with them. And if the assumption from the developer side was that only trusted things can use that, then there's the potential for a vulnerability to exist because they weren't creating it with a defense in mind, is what I was getting at. Right. Just a follow-on question. Mm -hmm. uh, 
can you give us like an example, like something, I know you wouldn't necessarily have looked at the other functions, mm -hmm. but like, can you just give us some sort of example? Uh, hold on, <laughs> let, me, let me process that. <laughs> um, so the only other one is also just a run as root function. And then the last example that I saw was just you've got a service running on the machine and you can just plain stop that service. Mm, okay. Thanks. Cool. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys. <laughs>